Hello folks, this is part two of being a disciple in Asia, Africa, and the academies. Let's pick up as Lynn and Kate tell us about what happened to all the guys on the mission field. And a lot of them pointed to, um, to difference in roles that kind of, or difference in what kinds of vocational ministry are open to men and to women, which would kind of maybe pull men stateside and push women overseas, this kind of negative image of who's where. So Whoa. I'm pointing to that. Others pointed to the support structures where we're um, of needing to raise support. Um, others pointed to uh, the, the pressure to build a career coming from families, coming from, you know, get started on your career. Don't do a short-term mission. Don't be thinking that way. Build your career you know, a respectable career. There's, there's pressures on men that, that, um, that I think are having a total. When you say pressures on men, what you're really saying is we have a dysfunctional discipleship for men. Ray talks frequently about the vocational necessity for believers. And I think you're going in the same direction with this. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd say disciple men, challenge them to rise to the occasion of, of following this God of the universe who does whatever he wants in his universe. And he's allowing us to be a part of his eternal work. Okay, Ray, explain yourself. Why is it that you guys are not getting out on the mission field? <laughs> oh, I think there's I think there's some really fundamental challenges. First of all, if you're an ambitious young person who believes you've been called by God to ministry, you'd like to have an effective broad ministry, which means you want to start a mega church in an urban area. And so there aren't very many examples of what you would consider clerical success which people tend to measure by how many people show up at church and how big your budget is and how big your staff is, you're not going to get much of that kind of feedback if, if you haven't been said you're really here to serve Christ and he's calling you overseas. But then you've got the other problem, and this was a question I think for both you and uh, for, for uh, Lynn and Kate, how much in our culture is it problematic that you've got all of this colonialism, imperialism, educational stuff that we're not supposed to be changing other cultures, we're not supposed to be imposing our religious or cultural values of other places in the world because they have a valid different identity. And if they have an identity of being a, a Malaysian who's, who's a Muslim, what right do I have to come in and try and convert them to Christ? And as a Christian, I say I have every right to go and try and convert him to Christ because Jesus is, is king. But how much of that whole cultural overlay that we face now, especially in the developed uh, West, Europe and the U.S., how much of that do you think is really limiting the number of men who would be interested in or feel called to go somewhere else in the world to share the gospel? Among our churches, uh, in the denomination that I've served, um, it's okay for a young man directly out of college to give two years. And so we have seen a lot of young men go and it's like, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. And now I can get on with my real life. Yeah. So that's that's one of the things I think that we face. Yeah, and that's one, one thing I, I think, missions may not seem like a career. It is a career, it is, it's highly specialized. It's, it takes the best of all you have. It's rewarding. It's fulfilling. It's exciting. It's full of adventure, full of really interesting things. So, so how, much, how much of the problem do you think really is made worse by the current practice in North American churches of gathering up 10 teenagers and going down and building houses in Ecuador or something for two weeks and calling that a mission trip? I mean, you get a lot of this sort of almost trivialization of mission outreach through this. We'll go have a couple of Bible studies. We'll go put together a couple of houses and that's a mission activity. And so I've checked that box and I've showed that I'm compassionate and I'm worried about people in the world. And now I'm home. <laughs> you guys are kind of putting yeah. together this concept of a re of resume discipleship, right? If I've done the two year thing, it's on my resume, check, done, move as, as Lynn said a minute ago, or this idea that um, I've, you know, as a teenager, been on my mission trip, uh, almost like the Mormons, I've done my mission. And so back to whatever it was I was doing beforehand, that, that all sounds 
dysfunctional to me at a personal level. That, and, and not that we're cold and cruel and saying, don't go on mission trips, but that the idea is that is sufficient. Now I am good, certified, rated, all, all is fine, versus this idea of a calling, a holy calling in the field the academy first, and then I want to come to the mission organization. I want to step into the academy for a minute. So I'm going to start with you, Kate, and say, what's it like as a disciple in the Christian academy and in the non-Christian academy? So I think it's really flourishing because the two contexts that I've been in at a Christian university for eight years and then uh, doing pre-field training for a number of years for people moving into Bible trans of to work overseas. There was a big emphasis on mentoring students, being available to students, having conversations with students beyond the classroom. Uh, at, in the pre-field training for people moving into Bible translation type, type um, service, uh, we lived in the dorms together, it was on staff, staff and students lived in the dorms together, ate together, went on field trips together, went hiking together, had skit nights together. A lot of conversations happened over, over lunch, over dinner. When I was a student, I had lots of questions of these seasoned older people that were working overseas. And it was just wonderful to be able to have that kind of person-to-person -person relationship kind of discipling for thinking about heading overseas and to be able to invest in, in the lives of students as they're at this, at this juncture in their life of seeing where their direction is, where they're gonna be heading, you know, lots of questions. So lots of granular relational mentoring yeah. walking yeah. alongside I think each it's, other. I think discipleship is a lot about relationship, going through life together, close enough together that there's stuff that happens there. And then there's Santa Barbara. Here you are at UC Santa <laughs> mm -hmm. Barbara. Tell me about being a disciple at UC Santa Barbara. UC How does that work? Oh, it, well, it was wonderful to study linguistics. It's such a, <laughs> such a wonderful department with amazing professors there. I just loved it. Um, and of course, suffering at the beach was hard. <laughs> so, um, so as a student, I think there's lots of opportunities for discipleship, both yourself and as you influence those around you. Um, I'd like to particularly point out international students. Being overseas, those people look just like the people that I saw as international students in the States. So I wanna really, really highlight We've got people from all over the world right at our doorstep and they're accessible. They're looking to be welcomed. We're, we're asked by the Lord to welcome foreigners. And um, these are people that are, that are ready, ready to be friends with you and from all over the world, all kinds of backgrounds. And uh, two in particular um, started with me in the PhD program from Japan. And uh, they were just delightful. I just, I just enjoy international students. <laughs> Anything cross-cultural, I think, is just a okay. um, But So these two Japanese students, they were interested in spiritual things right off the bat. Of course, you don't know that if you don't start some conversations and raise some topics, probably. But we became friends quickly and, and started having some spiritual conversations. They were both interested in studying the Bible with me. So we started having Bible studies together. One of them started reading through the whole Bible. She got over to Acts and she was just stunned that here these little wimpy disciples suddenly were full of power and courage and boldness <laughs> that really stood out to her. And it hadn't to be so much, but it really stood out to her. She, she went back to Japan and the next year became a Christian once she had returned. Um, the, other, the other friend of mine, um, we were in Hebrews, Hebrews 2.15. Since uh, uh, so Jesus shared in, the, in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. And she just looked at that, it was quiet, and looked at that, and then said, I don't know why people aren't talking about this. That's huge. We're held by our fear of death, held in slavery by their fear of death. That just really stood out to her. And she was just eating it up um, and seemed on the verge of becoming a Christian any moment. I don't know if she did or is, but, but it was just delightful to be opening up scripture together with, with my two Japanese friends. Ray, 
WPI, PhD, wandering the halls of a secular university, the subject's discipleship, what's it like? I was a non-traditional student, so I actually didn't wander the halls very much, but I do work with students pretty regularly in my vocation because we're trying to recruit students. So I'm, and there are student chapters for a lot of the talks I go. So I do end up engaging with students and um, often have conversations because they're in engineering fields. And so in general, they, I may find out that they're genuinely Christian and we have a wonderful conversation. Or I may find out that they're an antagonistic agnostic or atheist, and I'm really kind of a pain to them because I ask them right off the bat, well, you know, if, if God doesn't exist, then there's no such thing as morality, right? It was okay for Hitler to kill all those people. <laughs> you may not prefer it, but he preferred to do it, and there's nothing wrong with it, right? And really press them on whether or not there's any meaning or any value in life. And, um, and really try to let them see the emptiness that without God, there's no meaningfulness at all. There's no right and wrong. There's no purpose in life. And I've had a few good conversations with students in that uh, vein. But I think the biggest thing I can do is encourage them because God made us to rule over and subdue the earth as well as advancing his kingdom by making other people followers of Christ. And so as an engineer um, trying to figure out how to make steel better, that's something God called me to do. And I'm excited about doing it. And the world that he made is fascinating. And so to me, discipling means not what can I do, what one thing can I do today to spread the gospel? It's how can in everything I do, can I show the love of Christ and advance the kingdom of God in every single thing I do? And I think that's really what both of these ladies are talking about in terms of their uh, global uh, involvement and their uh, academic involvement is you've got to be discipling in everything you do. And that doesn't mean just trying to evangelize. It means being a mentor of what it means to be a Christian and, and having Christ as Lord. I think that's what, um, what Kate was getting to right off the bat with Lordship. I think that's right, right, Kate? <laughs> yeah, every part of life. So Mundane Lynn, stuff. the Institutional Missions Organization, what do you see in the institutional side of things? There is a dark side. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the dark side that um, was uh, some of the things you've talked about related to the church here has been kind of uh, being able to count people that you have led to Christ, that you have baptized. Um, that's what they wanted to know. How many, how many people? Have you led to Christ? How many people have you baptized? Uh, to the point that it uh, became a game almost. Uh, hmm. They seldom wanted to know what you were doing in terms of discipling these people and sending them out. Um, and so that was that was a dark side, at least to my organization. Uh, the bright side has been, I think, sharing information um, about all of the people who have yet to hear. And I think that's a bright side. Um, some of that you point out in your book came out of the Lausanne Committee and, uh, and some of that made our focus too much toward evangelism uh, and turned the focus from discipleship. However, there are many pockets of the world where the gospel was not shared. About 150 years ago, I think, there was a book that was written and it was written by a missionary who was serving in Southeast Asia and he kept looking around him uh, and he kept noticing that there were vast areas uh, where the gospel had not yet been shared. And he wrote a book about this great hole uh, where Christ had not been shared. And I think that's the kind of thing that we finally grasped uh, at the end of the 20th century, that there were many areas where there 
there was no translation. There was, uh, there were no churches. There were no known believers. There was nobody being discipled. There were no missionaries being sent. Uh, there were vast regions where that was true. And so I think the bright side has been that we, we now know. We have no excuse uh, to say that we don't know. Um, I was thinking, Dennis, one of the things that you keep mentioning in your book as one of your light sides, your humor, uh, has been the either the worst or the best job in the world is to be the Sunday school teacher for fifth grade boys, okay? <laughs> yeah. And that made me think back to a situation. Um, I was working toward reaching an unreached people group who had no scripture, who had no, me no media, uh, there weren't missionaries. Um, there was very little that had happened among these people. And there, I was told that there was a church that was looking to partner with such a, such a group. Um, oh. I was asked to share some information and I did with the uh, missions pastor. And I can remember so vividly that I was going through, he wanted some pictures and I was going through and I was looking and I had immediately passed over this picture and then I came back and it's like my hand is over it because it represented a couple who was had started doing translation work, but they represented another organization. And one of the rules is that you don't share information about another organization. <laughs> and what they're doing. And I finally, I prayed about it. I finally decided, okay, I'm not going to say anything about what they're doing. I'm just going to send the picture. And so I sent the picture and the missions pastor sat down with the church missions committee of about 30 people. And he's showing the pictures on a screen. And all of a sudden the chairman of the missions committee says, why that's, and he named the young man. And the missions pastor looked at him and said, how do you know that? I didn't say anything. And he said, he was in my fifth grade Sunday school class. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, indeed, that church did become a partner. So there's your fifth grade Sunday school teacher. <laughs> All right. Wow. That's a great story of the providence of God. I always yeah. tell young people who are professionals, that they need to volunteer to teach the fifth grade boys Sunday school class, <laughs> because if you can do that, then you'll become an excellent communicator to a much broader audience. <laughs> it's either sainthood or purgatory. I'm not sure yeah. which. One or the other. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so Kate, one of the challenges that we face when we're in global missions is not everybody speaks English or has a Bible translation. How important do you think it is for us to be able to translate the Bible and make it available in people's language. I think it's critically important. How could we become, how could we grow as Christians if there were no Bible in English? What would we do? How would we learn? How would we, how would our churches stay on track? How would we, how would, how would the, the spirit convict us like he does when we read the scriptures? There are thousands of languages around the world and we can go into a place and we can, at churches, if they don't have scripture, that missionary needs to stay there and <laughs> keep teaching and keep. But the Bible translation project, um, after after the, the national tran translators on the on the translation team have gone over each verse over and over again, figured out how to how to exactly to, to present it in their own language. After they've gone through that, they know the scriptures very very well. They've had a Bible college education being part of the translation project. And it's not unusual for them to become the pastors and leaders of new churches that emerge once people get the scriptures in their language. And then you know, the, the, the expat translator, they can get sick, they can go home, they can have kids that need medical stuff in their home country. It's not dependent upon the person staying there. But that translation then has, it's gonna stay there, it's gonna get reprinted, it's gonna be used there to to have the church grow and be solid and, and founded well and growing well. Without that, no, what happens? Things, <laughs> things don't work out so well. If there's a church planting effort without the core task of Bible translation being done in that language, and there are thousands, thousands and thousands of languages. 
around the world. A story in support of those people that spend those years um, developing a, a translation. Um, we were put under pressure, one of those dark stories, we were put under pressure to do a quick and dirty, that's their words, a quick and dirty translation of Luke so that we could move ahead with the Jesus Film Project. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had a partner who was from another country and he was discipling some young men and he, he took one of them aside and he said, how would you say God loves you? And so very simple, you know, little sentence. And the young man thought about it. And, and then he told him, okay, in my language, we would say it this way. Now, this language has a number of dialects. And so my partner took somebody from another county. And he said, if I said this to you, what have I said? And all of a sudden, he got this shock, horror. And the guy said, you've just said God wants to have sex with me. <laughs> Um, so why did oh, Jesus, right. why did they put Jesus in the manger? Oh, well, so the animals could eat him, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh. or, or why did Jesus, Jesus came as a lamb of God. Okay, so maybe it's an idiom for, um, or a, a metaphor for a drunkard, or somebody who's after women, or in some, some cultures. So there's a lot that goes into translation work, linguistic work, translation work, cultural mm -hmm. things, lots and lots that goes into translation one, one of the uh, needs to be done in all the languages that need it. And one of the great things about Christianity is God intended for it to be used in every language. And so you have the reversal of the Tower of Babel at Pentecost when everybody hears the gospel in their own language. And if you look at the principally narrative structure of scripture, it then allows you to have a context for understanding all of the special terminology. And so we tend to not appreciate the parables because the parables actually are a key to understanding what Jesus is doing and what he's teaching. And so the parable of the sower, where the love of money chokes out the seed, explains what it means when he says you can't love God and mammon and why he says it's hard for a rich person to join the kingdom of God. And that parable is translatable into every language. And so unlike Islam, where the Quran is only the Quran in Arabic, we can translate the scripture. And we know that because the New Testament is written in Greek and Jesus spoke in Aramaic. <laughs> so, so we know that it's translatable from the very beginning. So that's one of the beauties of it. And the narrative structure actually makes translation of complex and nuanced human concepts possible because you have a picture of people actually doing this. What does it mean to love? Well, Jesus lays down his life. That's why that's how God shows he loves us. <laughs> Kate and I had a long conversation uh, about a month ago about the questions that that Dennis was posing. Uh, and we were just talking through a lot of different issues. Um, that we had faced and going through lots of memories. And there were some things that we talked about that we haven't covered. Um, one of the things that, that we felt was important is that often discipleship on the field, and I think we can perhaps apply this here as well, uh, isn't always one person on one person for multiple, multiple years. Um, often it's sequential. Often God puts you in a place at a time uh, to have even one conversation with somebody, and he's going to bring somebody else into that, per into that person's life. Sometimes you're working with a team, and it might be a team from your own organization or agency, or it might be a team made up of people from multiple countries uh, and from multiple organizations. And each of you has a different relationship and a different approach with some of the same people. And so some of the questions that I might answer um, might be different from some of the approaches that another person might take. And so a person is getting a more well-rounded picture of what it means uh, to uh, do God's will for his kingdom to come and his will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Um, so we need to take discipleship seriously. 
that we need to realize that discipleship doesn't take place necessarily or even uh, primarily within the walls of a church, um, that it is life lived out with another person. Um, and it does require something of us. It might require sacrifice. It might require giving up some of the pleasures that we enjoy, um, both in terms of being a model and a witness, uh, and also just in terms of time management. And that time is more important spent with that person than it might be watching our favorite TV program. Um, there might be major costs, there might be minor costs, but there are costs to discipleship. And we need to uh, take that seriously. We're disciples and we're disciplers, both all at the same time. And I think it starts with who God is. And God of the universe, he created this thing, he does whatever he pleases in his universe. And we need to fit into that. One thing that in that um, one reason I became a Christian was when I took a biology class in high school and saw that this biology, the side of us, neurons, all of, all of that was pretty incredible. And it convinced me there was a God. This God was very big. And I needed to have the right relationship with God. It was not for me to tell God what it was going to be. It was for me to fit in with God and God's, what God said was true and right and what, what it needed to be. Because he's the king of the universe. He created the whole thing. And he says what's what happens. So that's all part of lordship and all part of knowing God. And I think one thing that pleases him is when we pursue who he is, we may have kind of a vague, vague blob of a God floating around the universe kind of an image. But God is a person. He has a personality. There are things that make him angry. There are things that delight him. There are things that motivate him. There's things that he cares deeply about. And we want to get to know him. We want to know him. We want to be conformed to his image. We want to be more like him. We want to do things that delight him. We want to take on his priorities as our own. That takes finding out who this God is. We can look at the scriptures and say, God, show me more who you are and, and want to leave our time within the scriptures. What more did I learn about God here? What more am I impressed about God here? What impresses me about God from reading this passage? I want to leave a church service with God being bigger in my eyes. We're, we're fully who he is. So he's not this blob, this nice benevolent blob floating around the universe, but that he's, he's the God of the universe who does what he pleases, and he interacts very personally with each one of us. And if we don't really know that, he's kind of a blob. We're not going to do that. <laughs> but he is all those things and so much more. So let his presence and his, his, how compelling he is, the king of the universe, doing just as he pleases in his universe, call us to be disciples of Christ. Folks, thanks for being with us tonight on this episode of the Disciple Dilemma podcast. What's it like over there? Conversation with Kate and with Lynn. Kate, thank you very much for being with us tonight. Well, thank you. It's delightful to be here. Thank you. And Lynn. Well, go follow. Go follow. It's the greatest adventure. <laughs> <laughs> That's my Lynn. I miss you. I wish we could be there in town with you. Thank you for being with us tonight, Lynn. Thank you. Ray, as always, thanks for all you do to make this thing work. Oh, happy to be part of it and really enjoyed meeting Lynn and Kate. Wonderful ladies. <laughs> Folks, we hope that you will keep up with us at www.discipledilemma.com. You can also track us on Facebook, The Disciple Dilemma. You can catch us on all the major podcast circuits, Spotify, Apple, Amazon, Stitcher, and so on under The Disciple Dilemma. And you can even find us out on Instagram at The Disciple Dilemma. So <laughs> thank you for listening to this broadcast. Please subscribe. Please follow, helping us to get some leverage in the digital marketplace so we can take on the dilemma. God bless you. Guide me, O oh, Thou great.